Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art. I'm going to read more of our book, Poison Power, by Dr. John Goffman and Arthur Tamplin. And I am doing this because I want us to press through the stigma of getting active. Uh, most of us are not active politically or socially, and we just go to work and come home. We're so overwhelmed. We don't make that little bit of extra time. And I think we're on a time on the planet where we need that extra time. We need to give that extra little bit. Um, you know, we're living in a toxic stew, essentially. And what we're hanging on to is the thread of maybe we can save humanity. Because obviously the nuclear cartel has no interest in being honest, like most of the technologists these days. And we are being consumed by the industrial military complex. Um Hopefully those of us who've learned this and understand this information will learn how to protect ourselves in the future and maybe save our planet. That's what I'm hoping for. Let me get into this. We're on Chapter 5, Promises, Promises, on page 138, second paragraph. Fourth, for some reason they chose to ignore a, ma a major pathway for delivering serious doses of radioactivity to man. The processes by which plants and animals in the food chain of man can concentrate radioactive substances in a massive manner. They say the radioactivity released from reactors now is and in the future will be only 1% of the official guidelines. We shall discuss this optimistic statement in, a more, in more detail in the next chapter. The guidelines they refer to here are in the maximum permissible concentrations in air and maximum permissible concentrations in water. In the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 10, pages 134 to, 1, 134 to 144, is a table listing the maximum per permissible concentrations of various radioactive substances in air and water, which are permitted to be released in an unrestricted area. That is, any part of the community outside the confines of the nuclear plant itself. Title 10 CFR Part 20. These levels are set to be a whole body dosage of 0.5 rads per year would result from breathing such air for one year or drinking about two quarts of such contaminated water per day. But what do such levels really mean in terms of what would occur? and probably will occur if such levels are allowed to be, to be in an unrestricted area where people live. I think we're seeing those effects already. Cesium-137 in the air near the power plant will deposit on nearby pastures. They, this will be grazed by cows, and the cesium-137 in their milk will eventually be consumed by children. If we allow the permitted level of 137, of cesium-137 concentration in the air for just one day, a child consuming one liter of milk every day will get a whole body dose of seven rads as a consequence of just one day's exposure. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to start cussing. <clears throat> Let me read that again. Cesium-137 in the air near the power plant will deposit on nearby pastures. This will be grazed by cows and cesium-137 in their milk will eventually be consumed by children. If we allow the permitted level of cesium-137 concentration in the air for just one day, a child consuming one liter of milk every day will get a whole body dose of seven rads as a consequence of just one day's exposure. If the maximum permissible concentration of cesium-137 in the air is maintained for one year, the dose will be 2,555 rad, which is 5,110 times higher than the 0.5 rad guidelines and 15,000 times more than the 0.17 rad radiation protection guide of the Federal Radiation Council. Not from the air that child is breathing, but from the milk he is drinking. You know, and the hard part is, it's way worse now. 
I'm glad my grandchildren don't drink milk or eat cheese. Let's look at the concentration in water. The maximum permissible contamination, which is MPC, is based upon the calculation that a 150-pound standard man consuming 220 grams of water at the MPC per day would receive a dose of 0.5 rad. Oh my God, I'm sorry, you guys. To begin with, a 75-pound child drinking this much water would get a dosage twice as high. He would be exceeding the guideline dosage, and so would a 100-pound pregnant woman. Man, women, and child, man, woman, and child have been known to eat, also been known to eat fish. The concentration of cesium-137 in fish flesh caught in a river could be a thousand times higher than the concentration in the water. Thus, a man eating one pound of fish a week grown in water by the MPC would receive a dosage of 15 rad per year or 30 times the 0.5 rad guidelines and 90 times the 0.17 rad guidelines. If he were a 75 pound child, the dosage would be 60 times the 0.5 rad guideline and 180 times the 0.17 rad guidelines. In other words, most people would exceed the guidelines if they ate only one pound of fish a year. The milk and fish represent biological concentration mechanisms. They by themselves serve to demonstrate quite conclusively that using air and water MPC values without considering food chains is meaningless. But as another example, let's look at the physical processes. If the cesium-137 MPC in air were maintained for one year, the radiation level would be 23 rad per year. Thus, when the AEC officials state that releases will only be 1% of the guideline, we shouldn't be lulled into complacency. The above example for cesium-137 in milk indicates that for the 0.17 rad guidelines, the releases should be 0.17. 0.007% of the MPCs, not 1%. If a more reasonable primary standard of 0.017 rad were applied, the allowable release would be only 0.0007% of the MPC, more than 100,000 fold lower than the current MPC for air. The AEC officials only look downwind from the plant for people breathing in the air containing the radioactive cesium, and they neglect totally the contaminated milk described above that can be shipped hundreds of miles away and deliver large doses to residents of a major city nowhere near a reactor. Thus, by neglecting all the important routes by which radioactivity from nuclear power plants, transportation of radioactivity, and from fuel processing plants and ultimate waste storage gets to people, the AEC officials conclude that in the foreseeable future, no one will be exposed to anywhere near the allowable radiation dosage. These fucking liars. We can easily test whether AEC spokesmen really believe what they say as they vie with one another who can, to see who can make the rosiest predictions. Commissioner Thompson, in a recent speech, uh, Power and Technology in the Future, AEC Commissioner Theos Thompson, delivered at the, quote, briefing conference for state and local government officials on nuclear development, unquote, Columbia, South Carolina, May 21st, 1970. Commissioner Thompson. Quote, as I have already indicated, it is likely that even by the Goffman hypothesis, that 170 millirad to the entire population will lead to 32,000 extra cancer and leukemia deaths annually. Less than one person per year will be in jeopardy due to the presence of reactors compared to the total sum of 300,000 cancers per year from other causes. Dr. Thompson became even bolder in his following statement. Quote, Instead of having 32,000 cancers per year, 
we probably have statistically less than one extra case of cancer or leukemia as a result of the presence of those nuclear reactors now in operation, construction, or definitely planned." Unquote. What in effect has Commissioner Thompson committed himself to, and, what, and can he make good on the commitment he so casually makes? He asks us to assume that we are correct in our to assume that we are correct in our prediction of 32,000 extra cancer deaths if the average exposure to everyone in the country is 170 millirads per year. He also assumes that future reactor programs will not result in more than one extra cancer death per year. This means he is willing to guarantee that the average dose of radiation to the American people will be 132nd of an eventual allowable dose, even after another 500 or so more nuclear reactors are spread all over the country. He guarantees a dose of about 0 .005 millirads. The AEC commissioners know perfectly well that it is meaningless to discuss only radiation from the nuclear reactor itself. They are here assuring us, in the words of Commissioner Thompson, that the combined radiation dosage from the reactor, from transporting fuel, spent fuel rods, from processing fuel, from radioactive waste preparation and storage, and storage of waste for all the centuries to come, including any and all accidental releases, will be less than 0 .005 millirads per year for the American people. We would be delighted if the AEC and the electric power industry could make good on this promise, which is made, remember, by the men assigned to the federal government to protect us all from radiation hazards. If the AEC could indeed assure the American people that the development of nuclear power plants in the number which they have promised us can be accomplished without exposing all of us to more than point. 005 millirads of radiation per year, I'm sorry, can be accomplished without exposing all of us to more than 0 .005 millirads of radiation per year. Critics of the nuclear power program would certainly withdraw their criticism and expressions of concern and alarm. But when we challenge this statement by asking what the official radiation exposure level be reduced to 17 millirads or less, AEC officials call us alarmists and insist that nothing of the kind is necessary. Does it not seem strange that they claim they can develop a widespread nuclear power industry without any possibility of exposing us to more than 0 .005 millirads per year? But when we ask for a reduction in allowable standards to a value of 3,400 times as high, they say they cannot allow it. They claim that a little leeway is needed for unexpected incidents. Surely unexpected incidents do not require 3,400 times as much possible exposure, which they characterize as, quote, a little leeway, unquote. We might understand two times or even ten times the guaranteed level, but 3,400 times strains our credibility. It's not credibility. Strains our credulity. I'm sorry. I think I'm going to stop. It's at 13 minutes. Um, maybe I'll post another one this evening in a little while. We have quite a ways to go on this chapter, probably another four or five pages. So I'll end here. I hope that reading this book encourages people to find out more about the negative effects of radiation and to withstand the onslaught from the nuclear cartel, which now that people are becoming educated, they're getting much more sophisticated to convince us that these scientists, Dr. Goffman and Dr. Arthur Tamplin, both MDs, doctors, who studied the ill effects of radiation on human life, they're attempting in every way possible to convince us that we've been had, that we have been misled, that it's a government conspiracy, that it's really just not as dangerous as we think it is. Um, it is far, far, far more dangerous than we've ever been told. It's the 90% rule in force. So I hope reading this encourages people to uh, do your own homework, 
put pressure on your congressman because that's really where it starts to hold the NRC accountable to demand a change in the way that the NRC is also the protector and the promoter of nuclear power, just like the uh, IAEA. And we need to change that so that they're just the protector or the promoter. But doing both, as we can see, they're basically killing our planet. So we need to get after these people, folks. I don't know what I can say here at the end of this reading to encourage people to get active, like really active. I understand how hard it is to get going. I'm very busy with my business work life and all the other stuff that keeps me going. Uh, and it, it takes some courage to call up our elected officials and stick our necks out and to call our, you know, like I called my water board guy and he never returned my phone call. I got his message machine. I've called him twice, never returned my phone call. My congressman says, thank you very much. The senator, yeah, thank you for letting us know. We'll look into it. It's not that big a deal. Like John Goffman says in this book, we're called alarmists because we care about life on our planet because we're still concerned that Fukushima is fucking off the charts. I'm going to end here. I, I don't know what I can say, but, you know, I'm we need to get we need to get active. We need to do everything, every everything that everybody can think of. That's what we need to do. That's what I'm doing. I encourage you to do the same. So I'll talk to you again tomorrow night. Ciao, you guys.